All right. Well, today on the show, we are excited to have Caitlin Shess with us today. Caitlin, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you so much for being on. Caitlin, you just released a brand new book, The Liturgy of Politics. And I I love the book. I love how you uh, just highlight that just the way that that we are being shaped by politics, how we engage with it, how it engages with us. I would love to know what is it that you saw that led you to, to, to realize how politics was affecting the church's spiritual formation? Yeah, so I was a college student at Liberty University from 2012 to 2016. And so right at the end there, I was in a very, you know, political environment. The school was having a lot of speakers and, and you know, Ted Cruz announced his candidacy there. And so I uh, was very involved in thinking about how Christians should engage in this because it was right in front of me. And then right after I graduated in 2016, I, I started seminary at Dallas Theological Seminary. And immediately, you know, the election hadn't happened yet. It was still in kind of all the buildup. And I was around all these people preparing to go into ministry and the election was divisive and they had questions and we were having conversations on campus and after class all the time. And the question people kept basically saying is I'm concerned about what's happening. I see people in my congregation who seem to not just have a certain political position, but they seem to have a pretty much idolatrous relationship with a party or a a particular politician and, and how do I respond? And yet struggling with kind of figuring out what's my role though in this like I have things that I want to say to my people or to even just my family my friends more publicly about politics, but where's the line, how do I engage with this and was taking a lot of spiritual formation classes and really realized that that those two areas were not as separated as we tend to think that they are that the role for a lot of us that were training to go into ministry of course, was not to to get up and tell people who to vote for or what policy to support, but recognizing that if because we didn't want to do that, we just stayed out of the conversation completely, we were missing this really formative thing that was happening in people's lives where their political engagement wasn't just telling them what policies to support or who to vote for. It was really teaching them a, a fundamental story about the world that was, of course, counter to the gospel because it was it was given for political gain or to gain power. And so recognizing that that was a place for leaders to come in and say, this is a discipleship question. This is about how are people being formed? And if I'm not aware of how they're being formed by politics, then I'm basically you know leaving a pretty significant force in their life untouched. And so that was kind of the, the impetus for writing the book was going, I really wish I had something that I could just hand the people that I'm having these conversations with and say, I'm not trying to give you any, you know, hard and fast answers, but I am trying to maybe poke some holes and ask some questions and maybe get you, especially the people I'm with who are about to start ministry saying, maybe just think about these things, you know, are there some ways that you could be more aware of how politics is shaping your people? Um, yeah. So that's really how it got started. Yeah. And so the entire time, because like you said, you know, as church leaders, we, we don't want to stand up. This is who you need to vote for and, right. and things like that. And so, so the response a lot of times from church leaders has been to not talk about politics. But the entire time we have not been talking about it. People have been shaped by it. Right. And, and it's impacted the church in, in all kinds of different ways. So, so you saw this and, and, and I hear a lot of church leaders talking about it. How, how has the church missed this though? How has the church missed mm. how we have been shaped by these things? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to assuming that the only way that people gain information about the world and what they believe is by their minds. You know, you give a sermon or a Bible study class or or maybe, okay, so they're trying to decide who to vote for. So they'll go and do some research or, or watch some news and that's just information in their heads. And so we don't have to worry necessarily about that, right? Like we're worried about the spiritual side, people's souls. And so, you know, if they go outside and, and get their political information from people, then there's no harm in that. Uh, without recognizing that the media they're consuming, the conversations they're having, social media, all those things, are not just giving information to your brain, they're also shaping your affections. They're drawing on what you should love, the loyalties to people you should have, what you should fear or hate. And really the foundation of the book is, it's always painting a picture 
of what the world should look like, of what the good life should be. You know, what is really fundamentally wrong with the world and what's the solution to that problem? And the reason that's so effective is because humans were made to kind of want those kinds of stories. And so of course, politicians and parties, they're gonna know this is how you get people. You show them something really scary or you show them a picture of what the world could look like and how we will achieve it. And so if you don't have that perspective on politics, if you think it's just information, it's not capturing people's affections, then sure, maybe we don't have to worry about it so much. But if you really get down to, this is really shaping people's loves, their desires, what they want in the world, and then really recognizing, okay, this thing is so divisive, which is why a lot of people don't wanna to touch it, but why is it so divisive? It's so divisive because it, it gets to people's identities, their fundamental community, the things that are really shaping their emotions and their desires, and so, if it's that fundamental, if it's working that deeply into people's hearts, then we have to be involved in it. But I think too often the church has said, here's how people gain information about the world. You give them a list of facts or a list of Bible verses. And in, in a certain really sad way, it almost seems as if some political leaders understood how humans work better than we have, because they've really used those tools of, of drawing on people's emotions and showing images and pictures and sounds that, that kind of get to a deeper level that might be a little subconscious. It might not be what people would write down and say, these are the things I believe, but they've been shaped by these desires so that when the rubber meets the road, that's the kind of driving, motivating force in their lives. Yeah. So, so in a sense, would you say that, that the church in a lot of ways has gotten discipleship wrong while political strategists and parties yeah. have, have figured this out? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, one of the people that I draw on a lot in the book, James K. Smith, he yep. has this great line about how too often the church has been pouring water on the head for the fire that's in the heart and going, you know, okay, people in my church are struggling with X, Y, Z issue. Here's Bible verses. Here's information. Here's instead of kind of what are some more formative things, whether that's, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of discipleship stuff, whether that's practices in the church and the music that we listen to that kind of is really a lot more formative, maybe even than the, the words we hear in a sermon. Are we really thinking through what will shape people in that lower register than what they would write down and say they agree with? Because if they did that, they probably would agree with the things that we want to, you know, teach and preach on. But is there, is there a certain sense in which that's not the problem? They know that information, but that's, that's not really what's gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think we'll end up getting into some of the ways that maybe churches can fix that. Yeah. One of the things, though, that really stood out to me from your book, I don't know if I've, I don't think I've ever seen this, is how uh, you actually say in the book that God created us for a political life. And then you trace that theme all the way through the Bible. I would love mm -hmm. to uh, unpack that and think about that for a little bit. What did, what did you mean when you said that, that God's created us for a political life? Yeah, so really, I mean, just starting in Genesis with the idea that, that we were given a commission to steward creation, which we tend to think steward or gardening, you know, let's take care of the physical earth, which is part of it. But really this picture of if you're supposed to multiply, go around the earth, that's creating communities. And so right from the beginning, before sin has even entered the world, you know, sin will change the needs of government and the things we have to be, you know, protecting each other from and all those kinds of things. But even before sin enters the world, this desire for humans to create communities and to steward the gifts that God has given them, not just to say, okay, let's take, you know, the created world, find a fruit and, you know, make some food out of it. Like that's a good example, but also just you've given us families and humans and how do we take, you know, the creative gifts that we have as creatures made in the image of God and then create new things with it, create communities, create norms for those communities. So they function in good ways. And, and then just seeing that through, you know, Israel, how God clearly cares about not just, you know, the inner condition of their hearts, but also the way their community is set up. And is there a mechanism for caring for people who are the most vulnerable, but also just, I mean, I think a lot of the times I grew up in churches where we kind of skimmed through the Old Testament pretty quick. And if we yeah. did, it was usually just to say, okay, God gave people all these laws. They couldn't, they couldn't keep up with them. And that's why we needed Jesus. Um, and that's like a small part of the story, but really having a sense of, wow, I mean, there's like pages and pages and pages of all of these really specific instructions about how to create a community. Hmm. That probably means God cares about, again, not just how an individual person has a relationship with another individual person, but how a communal group of people organize and structures their life together. And that's a political thing. It doesn't necessarily just have to mean how we vote or who the you know particular government structure is. I think all of that, just how we form and 
there's a great theologian, Luke Brotherton, who writes about this, who says that politics is forming, norming, and sustaining our common life together. So forming might mean some like, you know, pretty, you know, we need a leader, we have to kind of have an organized, you know, organized structure. But norming is also just all the things as a community that we care about that keep those forms, those like stricter ways of organizing, have them make sense and have stories that give value to them and, you know, all those kinds of things. And then even, you know, in the creation of the church, again, so much time spent in the epistles with how does your community function best? What are norms that help you relate to each other well, especially when it comes to divisions of class and, and status in a community. And then especially for me, what starts, you know, in the garden as here's a commission to, to create something with the good things God has given you, that doesn't go away in eternity. A lot of the churches I grew up in, the, the story ends in heaven and it's just, okay, I'll be, you know, floating around somewhere with a harp, but without a story of, in a resurrected, redeemed body, in a redeemed creation, where the picture that's given to us in Revelation is of a city, which is a perfect picture of humans using the gifts God has given them and creating, again, not just goods, which is part of it, but also communities that have norms and structures and all those kinds of things with the goodness of, of sin being taken out of the equation, but still communities still exist. And so what does it mean for us to, you know, we'll use that phrase like citizen of heaven a lot, or when it talks in Philippians about, you know, you're, you're not of this world, you're, you're a citizen of heaven. And we'll use that to say, okay, that we don't have to be involved in things now. Instead of saying, if there's some eternal part of your identity that has this political word associated with it, maybe that's something that we could do things now that would be a glimpse of that eternal version that, that doesn't have the constraints of sin and brokenness in our world, but that still we have this identity that will continue through eternity uh, as political creatures that create communities and, and try and create flourishing for people. Yeah. Cause uh, you, you have this quote in the, in your chapter uh, about, about that. I love this quote. Our eschatology is not just incorrect. If it ends in heaven, it has dangerous political and social effects on the world today. I don't know how a lot of people would react if I stood up in a, on a Sunday and in a sermon yeah. said, said that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that idea of just going to heaven has dangerous political effects, social effects. How does it? Can you unpack that? Yeah. So, I mean, the first part of that's important. It is wrong. <laughs> it's yeah, not good theology. Um, but also, the, you know, one of the ways that we can see good theology and work is when it creates better, you know, Christian faithful lives out in the world. And when it's mm -hmm. not doing that, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. There could be other reasons, but it's a good indicator. There might be something wrong with our theology. And so some of those dangerous implications are, Christians who want to interact in the world with a with an incredibly pragmatic singular goal of saving souls, which is important and part of you know our commission in the world. But if you don't have a robust vision of a redeemed creation in which we will do kind of you know perfected and redeemed and all those kinds of things, but work similar to what we are doing now, you know, vocationally, we'll have things that we will be creating and communities we will be creating. I love telling the women in my church that uh, they know that I'm a nerd. And so I'll say something along the lines of, I'm really excited to study theology for eternity. And people will be like, what do you mean? And it's like, oh, I, I think the things that I love to do that I think really God has gifted me to do, I will do forever. And so if you are someone who, you know, I have people in my, in my ministry at the church who their job right now is to go into communities where there's a, a lot of poverty and suffering and try and find ways to connect them with pro bono lawyers who can help them either, you know, kind of get rid of some, uh, you know, drug deals that are going down in an abandoned house or things that the, the city's not providing for them that they should and kind of advocate for them. And I'm like, if you're an advocate and you're trying to create sustainable communities, I don't think you'll be dealing with the sin that's in those communities now, but you will be doing something like that in eternity. And so if we have a vision of we will spend eternity doing the things that God created humans to do from the very beginning, that will be good material, you know, enjoyable things, then that should give us greater reason to seek the goodness of those things now. Um, you know, Jesus goes around healing people and feeding people and building relationships yes to witness to who he is and to bring you know spiritual salvation to people but also because there's something that just witnesses to the coming kingdom of god when you create some good material thing when you when you bring someone out of some kind of suffering when you elevate someone who's marginalized those are just good things because they reflect an eternal reality and so if we have that kind of picture of eternity it should give us greater impetus to seek those things in our world today instead of what too often happens with christians to say you know i really want to share the gospel with you but when I learn that, you know, there are all of these structural impediments to your flourishing, I don't really care about that. And that's not a good witness. And it also causes us to not to not create good, you know, things in our communities. Um, 
which is bad for so many. That's just not what it means to be a faithful Christian in the world. And unfortunately, when our eschatology is bad, a lot of times I think that's one of the reasons why, why we're not doing that. Yeah. That is such a different vision than what we hear a lot of times. It's just this, that Jesus came to save our souls. When yeah. this is over, we're going to go to his disembodied heaven. And so a lot of times what you hear is uh, that, you know, hear the saying, you know, what's, what's done for Jesus is really what's going to last. You know, there's this division between, you know, secular and sacred, the physical, right. the spiritual. And, and all. do you think that that comes into play? Uh, in this in this conversation and the way that we think about politics or the reason that we don't think about it at all is because well the spiritual is what's is what matters the most it's all about going to heaven one day and that causes us to miss all these other things how do you think that that impacts this whole conversation yeah absolutely i mean i i grew up in a lot of churches that were were faithful and loving and 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 i have no ill will towards any of them but there was such an emphasis just on the higher good in your life is any kind of ministry, explicit ministry thing that you do. I have this memory of being in high school and going to a summer camp. And, you know, of course, the Friday night sermon is the altar call sermon. And so at the end, there's the altar call and every, you know, way more kids than probably should have, you know, go up to the front and they pray the prayer. And then after that, it was like everyone goes back to their seats. And it was like the second call which was, you know, in our minds, the the next call, the greater call, after you've done the first call, the second call is, if you feel called to ministry, come up and and we'll, you know, pray for you up here. And the the message I think a lot of us got was the highest good you can do is some kind of vocational ministry, which I am doing and I love and I think is great. But there was this message of anything else that you do that's not that is a lower thing. And so if you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, like that's, that's not as high of a good as the spiritual good of, of being a minister of some kind. And then I think people take that, whether they, you know, go on to be a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, and then they apply it to the rest of their life. You know, the thing I do on Sunday morning, that's the, the highest spiritual good that I'm doing and anything else that I do is not. And then when they go out and maybe they go on a missions trip or they have some community outreach, again, the highest good is, you know, Maybe I'm not caring for the material needs of people, but I'm, but I'm sharing the gospel with them. And those have to be separated and one has to take priority over the other instead of seeing them as foundationally the same thing. You know, there's a reason why Jesus, yes, and then especially the early church, this picture in the beginning of Acts of sharing all things together, caring for the poor and the, and the vulnerable in their communities. One of the things that was so like mind blowing to me when I first got to seminary was hearing a professor talk about how the early church cared for not only the sick who no one else wanted to care for because they didn't want to get sick themselves, but but dead bodies who, who you know, they were in poverty and they didn't have the ability to have their bodies taken care of and Christians were going and doing this this really, I mean, what we would consider the dirtiest, lowest work possible. You're dealing with, with a body that has been rejected and has died. And that's the kind of work that they saw, not just as like an outreach thing, you know, in their culture, there was no one going, oh, I like what you're doing. I'm going to come join your church. You know, it was just, this is who we are as a people. Like it's all one ethic of how we interact with the world is we tell people the story of Jesus. We're faithful to witness to people in that kind of way. But I think if you were to go tell a very early Christian, which is more important, serving the poor or evangelizing, they would be like, those are the same. What do you? that's the same thing. What are you talking about? (laughs) And so our ability to separate those out as, you know, maybe Tuesday night we'll go evangelize and Wednesday night we'll go to a soup kitchen. It's like, those are not, those are not as separated as we tend to think that they are. Yeah. And, and it's connected to our vision of, of the, the city of God, our eschatology, that we bring that into this, this reality. And that helps us to see that spiritual formation is not just for this spiritual aspect of our lives, but for the whole thing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that also means that when we have a focus on spiritual formation in our churches, we no longer say, okay, we're going to start this new program, or we're going to do a discipleship event, or we're going to have a speaker come in, and have all of the kind of messaging about it be, if you've got something internal that needs to kind of be fixed, we've got some spiritual formation for that. (laughs) You know, it's about your internal, you know, condition, but it's not primarily or exclusively about that. And a lot of the ways we tend to talk about spiritual formation is, is personal and individual and internal instead of holistic. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about how the kingdom of God is a, uh, I believe you say it in the book is a, is a political reality. Can you talk about, uh, can you talk about that? 
Yeah, it's again, it's really interesting that Christians typically have said, you know, here's the spiritual side of things and we deal in that realm. And then everything else is kind of lower, especially political realm is mucky and beneath us. And, and yet there's consistent language in scripture that uses distinctly political terms. You know, when Jesus is going around preaching about the kingdom of God, which again, in the churches that I grew up in, I knew that we were supposed to share the gospel. I don't think I ever really heard the phrase, the kingdom of God, unless we were reading straight from the gospel and it was said. And I think if we had talked about it more, that, that would have at least given us more of an imagination for, you know, when I say share the gospel, I tend to mean, you know, you're a very individual message of your sin problem, your relationship to Jesus, which is important. And I, I never want to go so far one direction that I, that we lose sense of the individual relationship, but that was all I heard. And if we had talked more about what we're doing is what Jesus did going around describing with our lives and with our words, the kingdom of God, that would mean something more communal. It would mean something more material. I think it would help even if we didn't have our eschatology quite figured out, it would, it would at least poke some holes in that individual and disembodied in heaven kind of thing, because that doesn't really fit what I think of as a kingdom. And it doesn't really fit when Jesus is going around and healing people and feeding people and saying, you know, like he, he is spreading the message of the kingdom of God, especially one of my favorites is, is early in Luke, when, um, you know, Mary's already given the Magnificat, she's already described all of these things that God is going to do, this, this rich theology of who God is and how he's going to act. And then Jesus, you know, a chapter or two later, very beginning of his ministry is quoting from Isaiah saying, you know, I'm coming to free the captives, to, to feed the hungry, to, to give sight to the blind, this message of not just, yes, I, you know, you're going to hear about this later, but I'm going to die and be resurrected. And, and that's really important. But even before we've gotten to that, it's a picture of I'm coming to give you a glimpse before I even get to that part of what the kingdom of God is. And if we took that as our vocation too, of we're giving a glimpse of the kingdom of God to people, it probably would be a lot more material than most of the kind of, you know, ministry evangelism kind of things that we do now. Yeah. Because when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was not apolitical. He, he wasn't in right. towards it, was he? Yeah, and, and it's funny, there's kind of a few different images of Jesus that we have. We either have the like, you know, meek and mild, you know, holding the kids in a like watercolor <laughs> painting, you know, or sometimes some of us really gravitate towards the like table flipping Jesus. And maybe we even associate him with maybe some more like zealot sort of, you know, political activism sort of thing that really wasn't him either. And yet there's this consistent theme of being confronted with both religious and political leaders and, and being able to, to not back down on the claim of who he is. And then when you see his, his followers very quickly after that, when they say Jesus is Lord, they're saying Caesar is not, and they're making an implicitly political claim that while we're, you know, thousands of years later, we might look back and say, you know, oh, no, no, they're making a religious claim. They're not making a political claim. In their context, and, and I would argue in ours, those are not as separated as we tend to think they are. So when you make a claim about who who's ultimately an authority, you're making a political claim as well. And then, especially if you have scripture that you know God has given us that describes who he is and what his authority looks like, then you have a reason to say, I want to hold my government authorities that are supposed to come from him, that do come from him, and maybe you're supposed to look a little closer to what he is like and how he describes human communities. I have a reason to hold them accountable to that kind of thing in a way that if you don't believe in Jesus, if you're not going around saying Jesus is Lord, maybe government authorities can do whatever they want. But if you have this kind of description of what human communities are supposed to look like and who God is, and you know they only have authority because it comes from God, then you have every reason to hold them accountable when they're not looking like it. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I listen to you talk, you, you, you're describing, you know, this, this vision of the kingdom of God and, and, and Jesus. It's, it's so much bigger and richer than, than a lot of times we, we might think that it is. And, and do you think that, that that's why uh, maybe we drift towards uh, political parties, political talking points, to find our identity, to find all of these things that are there in the gospel? It's, it's in the story of scripture the whole time we've just brought this division in. And so if it's spiritual over here, here's everything else. And so that's why we've kind of drifted into making politics what it is in the church. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I love that. I, it, that makes a lot of sense too, to just say, if, if we're giving people a, a shallow version of the faith, and yet we were created by God for something more than that, then of course, we're going to try and find that elsewhere. And again, that brings it back to if you don't 
think as a leader, as a pastor, um, even as someone in a family or in a community, if you don't think you have a role to play in engaging politics, then you might be missing how it's affecting your people. Because again, if, if they're seeking identity and community there um, and it's replacing what should be you know, part of the, the family of God and the church, their community, their identity, um, then that's a, real, that's a huge problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so how can we know if our political engagement, our political, you know, beliefs, how can we know if those have gotten to the wrong place in our lives? You know, in the book, you talk about how politics can become an idol. Yeah. Are there ways that I can, I can know that maybe for, for me as an individual, maybe even for, for just churches as a whole? Yeah. I mean, I think part of it comes down to whether this is something you're doing reflectively internally or whether this is something you're doing in community. Um, one of the things I've, I've been doing this a lot with, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with people in my ministry of just asking some questions about uh, when do you have a strong emotional reaction to things? When do you feel particularly threatened? When do you feel like you, like your sense of identity or your community is being threatened? And then kind of asking, who did I just instinctively define as my community? Who did I think was in and was out in that moment where a fear was presented or, you know, and so trying to talk through, especially when it comes to media. So, you know, having, I have a, a, some resources on my website that I kind of put out in, in companion with the book, some spiritual practices for the election season. And one of them is going through a checklist of thinking through your day and when you're consuming media, when you're having conversations with people, when you're on social media, you know, kind of being able to say, okay, here's a picture of my day. What things are most influencing me? Um, is it kind of weighted heavily one side or the other politically or, or theologically? Is it kind of only from, you know, one community of people and not, you know, another community of people kind of having those sorts of questions to ask, but then also being able to ask, you know, in the moment, taking some, yeah, so having these sets of, of questions for not only, you know, media consumption, figuring out, okay, when am I consuming media? What kinds of media? Are there certain bias? You know, am I always listening to the same kinds of things or the same, you know, perspective on something? And then having the ability to, when you have a strong reaction to something, you know, so I just, I had a conversation with a woman in my ministry recently who uh, was getting in this Facebook fight with someone about a political issue and it was getting really heated and she was honest enough. I mean, so part of this is, is having some self-reflection, but she came to me and she was like, what was that? Like I responded so strongly and I don't really know why. And it gave us the opportunity to kind of backtrack and say, okay, what things were you believing about yourself, your community, about God, about, you know, what the good life should be that were threatened by that conversation. And maybe it's a good thing, you know, if in a conversation you really feel like a, a fellow believer is questioning, you know, God's goodness in a way that, you know, there's compassion there. But if you really feel like someone is threatening something that's true, that's revealed to us in scripture, then that, you know, that could be a good initial reaction. But if it's not that, if you're having a, a strong reaction to maybe your sense of identity being threatened, that's not in Christ, but it's in maybe your position in society or your wealth or your safety or any of those kinds of things, or if you feel like the community that you've determined for yourself is being threatened or some really foundational ideas that again are not, you know, from scripture, they're not from the gospel, but they're something else that's kind of humming under there, having the ability to talk through, hopefully with another person who knows you well, if something was threatened that caused that reaction, it's obviously having too, too great of a hold in my life. And so how do I work through to identify what that thing is and then to purposefully try and, and, and use, you know, things like spiritual disciplines and, and, and even just, you know, yes, books or sermons or all those kinds of things, but especially more formative things. How do I find ways to respond that can kind of counter for me against that dominant story? And it's hard because it, I do think it will require community. I think it will require some self-reflection, but I think the starting place for that is at least introducing to people, Hey, you might have some really deeply held beliefs that you're unaware of. Yeah. So right off the bat, let's just be aware that that's true. And when we have strong reactions, have some ability to have someone to talk through what's going on there, because we might think that we, you know, have only the beliefs that we would write down on a piece of paper. If we were asked, you know, what do I most believe? but there's probably something deeper going on and that it kind of has to start with that awareness. Yeah. I love those questions that you had there. Can you uh, talk about what is it about those questions, you know, about, you know, our community or what threatens us, that sort of thing. What is it about those questions that can help us understand what's happening underneath the surface and maybe the role that, that politics has started to play in my life? Like you said, I might not even be aware of it. 
Yeah, I mean, so part of it is recognizing that, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, that the language and kind of structure of how politics engages us is primarily through, I mean, fear is a is an incredibly powerful tool, mostly because it, it prompts both a psychological and a physical response. Some of it you're not even able to really stop. If a really you know powerful threat is presented to you, even if it's not real, even if it's exaggerated, your body will have a response to it. Things like loyalty, there's always trying to create an us and a them and who's in and who's out. And, and part of that's just the way our brains work. We wanna make fast connections. And so we wanna say, okay, I wanna put you in a category. And the easiest way to do that is, are you for me? Are you against me? You know, Are you in my community or are you not? And all of those kinds of things of that, that loyalty and then that picture of what the good life is, if we're able to recognize that that's the language and the structure and how all of this political information is being given to us, then hopefully those questions can help us dismantle, okay, what, what message did I take in that I didn't even maybe realize I was taking in and how often I was taking it in and how much it was forming me. And again, because it's sort of under the surface, you have to kind of start with some foundational information about how humans work and how politics works. And once you kind of have that, then hopefully those questions can, can help you figure out what have I been listening to and, and kind of simmering in that I didn't realize. Yeah. So what are some things that churches can do? You know, earlier we talked about um, how churches have put everything into information. We're going yeah. to give you information. And so you already have, you, you've talked about how that, that's not really helping us be formed. What are some things that churches can do to help people? Yeah, so part of the heart of the book um, is not to be super prescriptive uh, for two main reasons. One, I'm young and I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. <laughs> and two, uh, I want it to be applicable in different contexts and traditions. And so especially, for example, there's a chapter on the sacraments and that was really hard because I was trying to be very careful to, to hopefully make everyone a little bit uncomfortable and kind of push some things but also allow people from different traditions to see themselves in the description of, of how they're practicing those things. But really the heart is to say, okay, let's look at things like the sacraments, things like our worship, the order in which we do things, the songs we sing, any kind of language, prayers that we say repeatedly, um, spiritual disciplines, all of those things that are, are operating on, on a less than cognitive level. And let's just evaluate them and say, and so I give descriptions in the book of the kind of, I think the best, maybe, you know, faithful, really great way these things could work with the recognition that they don't always work that way. And we're all trying to do our best, but then trying to say, okay, if they're not producing in us these faithful lives in the world that they were intended to, if communion and baptism, for example, are not producing a really strong sense of this is my community, I have obligations to them and they have obligations to me, I belong to them. If it's not doing that, and, and let's give a really you know robust description of what it could look like for it to do that, and then your own context being able to say, okay, it doesn't look like that for us. Are there things that we could kind of alter or we could change the way that we describe it? We could do it in a different, in a different kind of way that could make it maybe more faithful to how it was intended to form us. Similar to things like the spiritual disciplines. In, in churches I grew up in, there was kind of talk of things like fasting or praying, meditating on scripture. But then having the ability to say, are we one, practicing these regularly in our community? Is there an emphasis on these things? But also, are we trying to be faithful to how they were intended to form us, not just inwardly, but outwardly? So for example, the early church, when they would be fasting, there's some really old letters from people who are not Christians describing Christians. And they say, when they fast for the sake of someone in their community who, who is impoverished. So it's about me depriving myself and, and gaining you know, some, some spiritual growth, but also really primarily, it's about feeding someone in my community who's in need. And so do we are we practicing things in that kind of way? I spend a lot of time in the book talking about feasting and hospitality because church would have this you know and, and throughout scripture i mean hospitality is, is an incredible theme that i never really heard about growing up but is all over the place of do we really have a sense of bringing people into our communities into our homes who are not like us and not having it just be an act of charity but having a real relationship be built there where they bring food that i've never had before and i you know cook something that maybe is <laughs> different to them and and we can we can have an actual relationship that's built and that does something that, you know, all throughout scripture, eating together, building relationships in that kind of context should change how you think about what matters in your community. If you have someone over for dinner, but they're just a neighborhood over and you had no idea that the city isn't providing trash service for them because they're in a pretty vulnerable community and there's no one advocating for them. 
you have a relationship now, you're not just going through their community and handing them out something, you know, you could really, with maybe some more resources that you might have, advocate for them in a, in a political way. I mean, that requires a, an email, a phone call, maybe a bunch of emails and phone calls to someone who's in government leadership, but you're doing it because you've built a relationship with someone in your community who's in need. And so all of that, just to say that there's so many different ways that we could think about doing this, and I, I try not to be too prescriptive about it, but just evaluating what are the repetitive, embodied, value-giving things that we do in a community. Outside of, I, I care about good sermons and Bible studies, but outside of those things, what are those things we're doing? And, and could we take a different perspective on them? Could we look not just at how they're forming our people internally, but how they're forming us in the way that we live out in the world? And if it doesn't look good when we look at it from that perspective, are there some things that we could change to, to make them more faithful? Yeah. And, and if, we're, if we're honest, if we're honest, you know, just the, the, the emphasis on discipleship is, is all information. If we just look yeah. at where that's gotten us, uh, the church in a lot of ways looks just as divided as the world. Right. And, and so, so this, everything you're talking about, when, so when you use the word liturgy, that repetitive embody, uh, embody those em, repetitive embodied practices, that's what you're talking about, correct? Yeah. And I, I know some people, I mean, even the, the churches that I grew up in, if you used that word, it would be kind of a little off putting <laughs> just because we don't do stuff like that. Um, but we did, right. We had an order to our service. We sang three songs, then we had a sermon, then we all went, you know, there was an order to things. Absolutely. And so could we just be intentional about thinking about that? You know, I, I have some, a couple sections in the book where we're talking about music because again, sometimes low evangelical churches will say, you know, oh, we don't do liturgy, but we sing this one song that we learned on the radio, like, all the time and the language in that song is going to be the language that's humming underneath the surface of your people so are we being intentional enough to go okay i want i i don't want to just be the seminary student that's like we should have good theology in our songs you know yes we should but also are we really thinking about how they are forming our life in the world if the songs are all individual if they're all about my relationship with god and they're not about his redemptive purposes and creation if they aren't pushing us to to care about people outside of ourselves if they're not representative of the whole body of christ you know if the songs only apply to maybe a a wealthy white congregation in a big city in america you know all those kinds of things to ask questions about how are we being formed even if you're not going to be in a context or in a church that's suddenly going to start reading a bunch of written prayers and using a formal liturgy and reading a bunch of creeds. Like if that's not you, you know, maybe learn from some other traditions, maybe adopt some of those things that could be helpful, but also more than that, just are you thinking about there is a certain order to the things we do. We say a lot of the same, even if we're not reading a written prayer, we say a lot of the same things over and over again. Are we reflective enough about what that repetitive language and action with our bodies is, is telling people because it might not be the thing we think we're communicating. Yeah. Yeah. Caitlin, just a, a few more questions. So as we're recording this, we are five weeks out, I believe, from the election. And when you look at things in the church politically, you know, and, and with just political engagement, what concerns you right now? What concerns you? And then we'll, we'll go positive. What gives you hope? So what, what concerns you? You know, I think a lot of people in an election season will say they're worried about Christians or, or really they're worried about the church getting too political um, because we've had a legacy where sometimes Christians have have identified a certain party um, for, you know, American evangelicals, the Republican Party as, as central to their faith. And that's been destructive. And I, and I agree with that. However, my fear usually is that we will see a divisive election season and think we just have to get through this. Like, mm -hmm. we'll just... You know, our churches have people with different political views. We'll just stay silent about it. <laughs> we'll hope that it blows over and then we'll be good. Instead of one, recognizing that some of those divisions are deeper spiritual divisions about what it means to be a faithful Christian in the world, about what, how we're supposed to treat people, all those kinds of things. And this could be a real revelatory moment in, in the sense of unveiling some things, some divisions that are deeper. And I don't want us to miss that opportunity. And then my second fear is that because it's so divisive and, and people are, are quite heated about it, leaders and pastors will not only be afraid to kind of make explicitly political statements, but more than that, they will be afraid to, to preach the gospel, to, to come to a passage, you know, next week the passages on how we treat foreigners or how we use our money or how we treat the poor and the fear of being labeled political will keep people from being faithful to what scripture says. 
instead of recognizing that maybe the fact that this will be so disruptive to people means it's exactly what needs to be said. Um, and it's hard. I don't want to downplay the difficulty of people in, in congregations where, where there are certain lines you don't cross and they're not just the lines the gospel gives us, they're lines of, of politics. Um, but that, that's really the fear that, that concerns me is, are we missing an opportunity to be faithful to scripture because we're worried about how people will, will perceive the political, you know, if we'll step on some political toes um, that probably need to be stepped on. Yeah. What, uh, what gives you hope? You know, I, I really do think more than I have, I mean, I'm young, but when I was growing up in the church, the, the sole extent of, of political action for Christians was probably abortion and gay marriage. Those, kind of, those are the two things we're going to talk about. And I am so encouraged to see people my age, people older than me in, in churches, especially in my context here in Dallas, churches all over the, the Metroplex, who are recognizing that there are more issues to be concerned about. And there are some issues that are even more, you know, better faithful examples of, of Christian engagement. One of the ones that is, is a couple years old, but I, is one that I come back to a lot. There's a short film called The Ordinance, and it's about a bunch of churches uh, in Texas, like Baptist, Catholic, like crossing all denominational lines, who realized that payday loan places were just incredibly exploitative in their communities and they couldn't pass a piece of statewide legislation and so they went bit by bit in small cities and tried to pass an ordinance to just put some restrictions on them so that they could you know be per they could be protecting the most vulnerable in their communities and it was just such a picture to me of what it would look like one for a political issue to actually create unity <laughs> for people across denominations to say i care about the poor in my community not being exploited and actually there's a beautiful moment in the film where someone acknowledges that there are people in their congregation that either own or financially benefit from these payday loan places and realizing actually I feel like it's a it's a pastoral need for me to extend the mercy of having restrictions on your ability to exploit people that it is harmful to your soul as well to be engaging in this thing that this practice that is harmful to people and and I think it's important for us to to again not be afraid of stepping on toes to be faithful to what scripture says um, but also to seek, you know, in a very practical way, the flourishing of our community. And I think sometimes stories like that are not the ones we hear about Christians. And yet I know they're happening here in my context and all over the place. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. So what would you say to somebody who is in the church and, and they feel like they are not at home in either political party? Uh, what would you, what would you say to them again, going into the election uh, or just in general? Yeah, I mean, people have said this a lot, but I think it's true. I, I think we are supposed to feel homeless <laughs> in either party. If, you, if you're feeling too comfortable, if you're feeling too much like you have found the party that represents everything you care about, uh, then I think you're prioritizing your political preference above, above your faithfulness to the gospel. Hmm. But I also, the thing I would just encourage a lot of people with, you know, I get asked the question all the time of, it's just so impossible. I can't vote for anyone. I don't know what to do. And the thing I try to tell people is, you know, your presidential vote every four years is one way you participate in politics. And it's, a, it's an important way. And you should do your research and be faithful and try to make the best decision that you can. But you shouldn't put the full weight of all of your political action in the world on this one vote every four years. Because if that one vote has to carry everything you care about, everything you are, everything that matters to your community, then of course it will be impossible. <laughs> there will be no way for you to make a good decision. But if you are engaged in your community enough to know the needs of the people around you and you recognize that down the ballot there are votes that are incredibly important to your community you know my my neighborhood in dallas a lot of the research that i've done for my election is things like the judge and the sheriff because there's a community center down the road that i will go vote at that has a lot of kids that are probably going to have more likelihood because of their vulnerability in our community to those kinds of elected officials. And so I want the best ones in there to, to protect them and, and to be faithful to the jobs that they were supposed to hold. And so are you, are you seeing the ability to vote for different reasons at different levels of the ballot? Are you seeing the responsibility you have to your more immediate community? National politics can get really messy and really divisive and it's so far one way or the other. But are you just learning about the school board members, you know, that matter to the kids in your community and and trying to be faithful in those ways and recognizing that you can care about certain things that you vote one way, you know, in one part of the ballot and then a different concern drives your vote in another part of the ballot. And then outside of voting going your political action is the letters that you write, 
the, the social media engagement that you have, the way that you're serving, you know, in that community center down the road or the way that your church is serving people. If you recognize that all of those are different avenues to care about all the things you care about, it should give you some freedom to kind of care about one thing in one vote, care about another thing in your service in your community, care about another thing on a different down ballot vote and not feel like every vote has to encapsulate your full identity and everything you care about. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word. That's a great word. Well, Caitlin, uh, I want to honor your time. Thank you so much for being on here today. Now, now you, you mentioned earlier, you have a website. And so what is that website? It's CaitlinShess.com. And so if you click on book, you can find a bunch of links uh, if you want to purchase the book, but then scroll down a little bit and I have some prayers for the election season and some practices for the election season that, that I think are, are hopefully good resources, not only for individuals, but, but hopefully for communities. Yeah. That is great. We'll absolutely link to that in the uh, show notes. And Caitlin, if anybody wanted to connect with you on social media, they can find you where? Twitter, Instagram. That's where I spend too much time on Twitter. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, Caitlin, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's been great. Thank you so much.